how it is the Sixers Talk podcast live from Rivers Casino. So glad you could join us. Danny Pommels, Noah Levick, our producer, Ben Barry, making things happen as always in the cut. And uh, we are proudly brought to you by Wilmington University. Uh, the season is winding to a close. We'll try to make sense of all the math and the scenarios. I think based on my assertion of what's going on, uh, the seventh seed is probably likely where the Sixers will land. Uh, Noah, if you could help us make some mm-hmm. sense of all that's going on. Two games left in the season. Man, it's felt like, you know, I guess we've been doing this a few years now, but this has been a definitely a trying season with the injuries, which we have already, you know, dealt with in the past. But the Harden trade, Maxie being out some time, Embiid returning, DeAnthony Melton's back, and he's feeling good. Uh, so several things to get to, but – um, a lot of people concerned about the playoffs. Uh, we talked on the last podcast with Amy Fadul that the Flyers have a game at home April 16th, which uh, kind of throws a wrench in if the Sixers are hosting a first-round game. But they're in the seventh seed. Uh, Orlando Magic coming up on Friday. Um, but what, what do you? What, what's the scenario here? And are we likely to host a game here in this play-in? Yeah, I think for a while the seventh seed has been the most likely outcome, but. Thanks largely to the Sixers being on the six-game winning streak, it's possible they could get up to number six, but they need need some help. So yeah, it could get pretty complicated for sure. They could they could help themselves a little though by winning again uh, against Orlando because that is one of a few teams that have still not secured a position above the Sixers. The others are uh, Cleveland, Indiana, and Miami. So. Indy, pretty simple. Sixers need to go 2-0, and Indy 0-2 in order for the Sixers to be the higher finisher. Uh, Miami controls its own destiny in the sense that a 3-0 and finish for the Heat would put them above the Sixers. And then, uh, yeah, with Cleveland and Orlando, the Sixers are essentially hoping on those teams not finishing strongly, but the Sixers have a little bit of power there in the sense that Orlando is up next. So I think it gets more intriguing for sure if the Sixers win that game because uh, then there's some pressure on the Magic uh, with their last few to hold off the Sixers and just in general not drop into the play-in, which is wild. They've been in that 2-4 through four picture with the Eastern Conference for quite some time. Now Orlando uh, might drop back into this play-in conversation that's largely been dominated by Sixers, Pacers, and Heat. So uh, it could get very complicated in the sense that, you know, if the, if the Sixers have the same record as Cleveland, then we're going to like the fifth tiebreaker. And then there's all this stuff that we, we might need to do, but essentially if the Sixers keep winning, they improve their chances a little of moving out of the play-in but Sixers ending up number seven is still the most probable outcome here. And as we've said, it's, it's not a bad one, but if you're in the play-in, anything can happen. And if you lose that seven versus eight matchup, of dun, course, dun, dun. yeah, well then, you know, the disastrous scenario is, is you're out entirely uh, losing that second game. But even if you win the first, uh, sorry, lose the first, win the second, the Boston, Boston Celtics. Celtics are up, and uh, I don't, I don't think that's a desirable scenario for anyone. So that, that's kind of the general lay of the land, um, as, as I understand it. But I think indeed the bottom line is the Sixers have helped their chances of getting number seven quite a bit, but uh, more help required from teams around them in order to potentially move up and and out of this play-in picture. With all that said, if you haven't been to any Sixers games this season or if it's been a while since you've been down to Wells Fargo Center, Friday might be a real fireworks type of affair with the Orlando Magic and them trying to secure their playoff position and the Sixers trying to win out here. And um, it could be a good one. could be a good one. Hopefully uh, Tyrese Maxey is back and fully healthy. He missed last night's game. Joel Embiid. Um, did, did we, are we making a big deal of that little knee tweak things that he had, that little hyperextension? Or he looked like he came back and played. And looked like was he was fine. fine. I yeah. think it was just a big deal in that it was a very concerning image for everyone that yeah. he seemed to buckle and – instantaneously he like let out a yelp right. but Nick Nurse basically said he, ca- he called the timeout and Embiid situated himself as usual for for a timeout and you know things were fine from there and I, I thought his movement looked okay he did go 36 minutes last night which is his most since returning 
and the stints were longer. They were around nine-ish minutes at the at their lengthiest. So I, I think he's trending up, but I think uh, still work to do for Joel Embiid to round into form. Uh, but it, it's pretty wild that him getting back into game shape, it, you know, is the equivalent of uh, whatever 37, 11, 8, and 3 stat line. Right. Uh, he is just so much better than the large majority of opponents he faces. Passed the ball really well last night, which I think is encouraging. And the Sixers, I think, are fine-tuning some of their spacing and cutting around him, which is important with the playoffs in mind. Uh, but yeah, I think alarm bells correctly went off in that moment. But as I understand it, uh, things are, are A-OK moving forward for uh, Joel Embiid. The Sixers um, have played four games since the last time we had a podcast, uh, the Grizzlies, Spurs, Pistons, and Heat, and um, some great basketball mixed in there. Six-game winning streak, four games in a row here with Joel Embiid. Um, It's all shaping up in a great way as the Sixers are getting healthier. I mentioned DeAnthony Melton back. No Robert Covington as of yet, but um, as far as the depth and um, the mixture of players and uh, people out in the court, who starts, who comes off the bench, uh, you know, good problem to have for Nick Nurse. Um, a stat that I wanted to share with everyone that I feel like gives a lot of credence to the idea that this is a team that can go on one of those uncanny runs because they're healthy and in position is that uh, the Sixers in this uh, six-game win streak, that's their fourth stretch this season with at least six wins. That is tied for first in the NBA. So four, six game. This is a team that can get hot and go on a roll. Um, and I don't think they had any three game winning streaks without Joel Embiid. So he's played under forty games, and they've had four winning streaks of at least six games while he's active. I, I think that's that's extraordinary. Yeah. And yeah, it speaks to the fact that the healthiest version of this team is statistically up there with the best in the league no question yeah kind of got robbed obviously with joel missing a lot of time with the meniscus injury and what could have been this season um but it's about getting hot at the right time we continue to uh, draw upon the example of what the miami heat were able to do from the play-in and make a nice you know run deep into the postseason hopefully that's something the sixers can mimic um suddenly things take in shape in the eastern conference and You know, in a fortunate way, because of the injury to Giannis Antetokounmpo last night, he goes down with a calf Achilles injury. The MRI didn't reveal any injury to his Achilles, but there's a strain there, and he has to kind of bounce back from that. Very odd time to get that. A lot of Sixers fans hoping to face those bucks and and, uh, enact some revenge on Doc Rivers and kind of (laughs) kick them while they're down, so to speak. Uh, But... um, do you have an idea of if you feel like you're hoping they can get into the sixth seed so they can avoid the Bucks, or do you want to face the Bucks, or do you have any inclination one way or the other? It feels really wide open to me. I think the strongest take I would have of those potential opponents is that the Cavs look like a good matchup for mm-hmm. the Sixers. They, they split the season series, but... Uh, Joel Embiid has previously had some dominant games against Jared Allen. I can recall a 40 and 10, a 40, 40 point triple double, I think. Uh, and, and I think the Sixers guard the, the Cavs, you know, perimeter stars well. Cleveland's been skidding, doesn't, doesn't seem anywhere close to, to their best right now. I think that's not a bad opponent to draw. But yeah, outside of that, uh, it feels like almost anything can happen in the East. I agree if the Bucks move forward in the postseason without Giannis or with a diminished version of him, that's uh, an opponent you you probably wouldn't mind facing either. 500-ish teams and Stock Rivers took over, uh, though they did win last night against... uh, a you know a Boston Celtics team with zero motivation, but it's still still a victory. And uh, Patrick Beverly was inserted into the starting lineup. That was a big move uh, with Doc Rivers throwing him in there in place of Malik Beasley. So I think the Bucks feel wild card ish as well, but doesn't feel like there's a lot of good vibes or optimism in Milwaukee right now. That that can change. Things always are unpredictable come playoff time. But uh, honestly, I think the Sixers would go into most first-round matchups feeling they've got superior talent and that they've got a good chance to win. Uh, But I'd say 
if you draw Cleveland, if you if you manage to go up to number six and Cleveland's the number three or, or something along those lines, boy, that that sounds pretty good to me from the Sixers' perspective. Yeah, particularly how things were trending at a certain point, and we thought that, man, are they going to be you know in that nine ten matchup or something like that if if things kept going the wrong way, but. Uh, things are trending up. Uh, part of that trending upward is the return of DeAnthony Melton. And, um, you know, a guy who he hit his first shot and, and stroked it. Um, and good to see him back feeling good. Not his best performance by any means, but he felt good about how he was out there. Had been dealing with this pinch in his back that he was feeling in his downtime when he wasn't playing basketball. So then he really knew something wasn't right. But... Um, he said he felt good last night. He was, um, you know, defensively able to, you know, be better um, than he had been in those two games where he came back. I guess that was late February or whatever. Yeah, late February. Uh, it, it was sort of a mix, a mixed bag for him. One of those games was strong, and then in Boston, just a huge bummer that they take him out. I think at halftime of that game, and it's and it's a here we go again situation. So. Sixers, of course, have their fingers crossed that he's uh, back stable and, and healthy, but uh, definitely a great development for them if, if he can remain on the court. I don't think anyone's banking on him being a 30-plus minutes guy and, and making huge strides as far as you know the number of minutes he's able to, to comfortably take on. But look, I, yeah, I thought outside of missing, missing a bunch of jump shots, he... He did indeed look explosive. Uh, very soon after getting on the court, he soars up for an offensive rebound and drops off a little assist. Uh, so you see that just natural ability ha- he has to find the ball, to chip in, and to fire up shots quickly around the Sixers stars. Uh, so all of that's looked really good on paper, but there was a lot of pessimism at one point, clearly. And Melton himself said, he did have doubt, and he did have some down moments, but he just he just tried to focus on moment to moment, controlling what what was within his power, and it could be a big deal for for the Sixers if and big if he stays healthy and is playing around the level he was before all this injury misfortune hit him. Opening night starter for this team, and a guy who can take on tough defensive matchups, force turnovers, play the style Nick Nurse likes, and uh, give, the, give them a little juice in moments where they need it, I think, on both ends of the floor. Also a really strong guard rebounder. So, yeah, one of those guys where it's not difficult to imagine him helping the Sixers winning the possession game in the playoffs. Like, that's a strength of this team, and I think the notion of like, Melton really enhancing that in giving them some pop off the bench, you know, it, it sounds awesome. And him being back on the court, yeah, it's it's a really nice development for the Sixers. But uh, we'll we'll see what's next, and we'll see whether he's able to uh, sustain good health. Buddy Heald, who hit five threes, I think last mm-hmm. night, was talking afterward about kind of trying to get acclimated with you know playing with Joel Embiid and where he likes to pass out of double teams and D'Anthony Melton and how he likes to, you know, get out and run and transition and how, you know, just all the normal things that will come with playing with someone you haven't played with in game situations. Um, I do like Buddy coming off the bench offensively um, and what he can provide there, particularly when he's hitting shots, of course. Um, And do you see that as the potential you know, mixture with him and Melton and then campaign or like, how did do you, you kind of see that playing out with how the backcourt looks when Maxi and probably Lowry, who also missed last night's game uh, are sitting down or Lowry and Oubre aren't, aren't on the floor. Yeah. I mean, I, I think as we've said before with Melton, he can guard up effectively. So like if pan- campaigns in a good groove, it's okay to play in minutes with, with the Anthony Melton. And I think, that's that's a speedy, high energy duo. Right. Uh, and Buddy Heald likes likes getting those transition threes. Likes playing an up tempo style. And Melton's defense kind of masks any of those issues that might be there with the opposing guard. Yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah, I mean, campaign so far ha- has been a really high and cold player. He's had to, had some awesome nights, and he's had had some clunkers. So I imagine with Nurse, he'll be he'll be flexible with those minutes. Um, I think DeAnthony Melton. He's not a natural pure lead ball handler. Mm-hmm. But 
if there are lineups where you want a little more size around him for whatever reason, he can handle backup, you know, backup one duties and, and do that effectively. But yeah, there, there's so much to sort through for Nick Nurse. I think Melton, without question, when, when he's playing good basketball, deserves a good volume of minutes. And so does Kyle Lowry. So does, so does Tyrese Maxey. If campaigns hitting everything he throws up there, he deserves minutes too. Um, but I think Melton was an opening night starter for this team for good reason. And there are a lot of lineups where he can, he can slide in there just fine in all honesty. But yeah, I think, I think in theory, the idea of him playing alongside Buddy Heald and helping the Sixers bench have a little more of a spark and a little more of a transition heavy game, that, that sounds fine to me. Wow, man, suddenly the Sixers have some uh, choices to make, some lineups they can mix and match, and, uh, you know, maybe dependent on the matchup, we'll see who's out there and who starts along with Embiid and the rest of the fellas. Um, but, um, you know, we're kind of at that juncture of the season where, you know, you kind of are who you are. For most teams, the mm-hmm. Sixers team also is just getting, you know, guys back at a, a really cool time. And in like a lot of guys um, – it's a contract year, and you kind of feel bad for DeAnthony Melton, who had played so well leading up to the injury, which would have gotten him uh, probably a great payday, but kind of well, up in the air depending on. This is, I mean, this is a great development for him in that regard. Yeah. I mean, if he had ended this season without playing again, that would have deflated his value considerably in the free agent market. Now I think that's that's much more up in the air, yeah. and if he could have a nice postseason. Uh, that that could soar up soar up again as far as him having suitors around the league who uh, like the idea of him as has a long term piece for their squad. Uh, just just a little buddy heel tidbit. Uh, last night was his 82nd game, and uh, wrote a story about this. But he could of course get up to 84. Would be the first person to do that in the NBA since 2004-05. Uh, Casey Jacobson did it uh, then. There's only been three other players in the 2000s who have played 84 games in a season. Is he aware of that? Uh, I, I brought it up, so okay. now, now he is, yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, he like he, he really takes pride in that. He's long been an Ironman player um, at, at an elite level, loves the game, and just want, wants to be available whenever he can, and has, has been really darn good at, at staying healthy. I mean, we, we see so many guys, as the Sixers know well, who, who get the, the bumps and bruises that sideline them for a game or two. Hasn't happened to Buddy Heald, and there's been a little bit of luck as far as how uh, the deadline broke and, and him being able to play 84 this year. So I don't know, I think that's that's pretty neat and pretty impressive for, for the Sixers to have a guy who could, who could set a little bit of history um, if he indeed suits up for these next two. We're talking all this lineup stuff. I think we should just put it out there. Who, who's your starting five? Or do you like Heald coming off the bench? Uh, do you like Ubre in the starting lineup? You like Tobias in the starting lineup? W- what's your thought there? Where the Sixers are strongest? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, Tobias Harris. Yeah, he returned last night. Had been out three games with the left knee injury. You know, had a had a solid night, fifteen and twelve. I just think realistically, he, he seems like he's going to be a starter mm-hmm. for this team. There have been instances here at the three. Um, I'm, Do you I'm, like Batum and Embiid? In the yeah, so I definitely, okay. I definitely like the the idea of um, Nico Batum starting as well as Kelly Oubre starting, but that that's not going to happen if mm-hmm. Tobias Harris starts as well. So, um, yeah, I I think if, if we're you know putting Harris's name in there in Sharpie, um, I think yeah, Nico Batum, Joel Embiid. I'm perfectly fine with uh, a healthy Kyle Lowry share in the backcourt with Tyrese Maxey. Um, I think the just sensible, veteran-tested guys around two all-star amazing scorers just makes a ton of intuitive sense. Um, so I think think that sounds like a good lineup for the Sixers in, in most matchups I can imagine. And then you have Heald, yeah. Oubre, Melton. Pain could have could have a ton bench. of depth yeah. there. Yeah, uh, Paul Reed as as a back of five as well. Nico Batum as a small ball five option. KJ Martin's been playing good basketball. Ricky Council, if his contract were to be converted, is a spark plug sort wait, wait. of sort so, of option. So you're saying not not saying I I am uh, projecting these guys to be available. No, I wanted to get back to your starting lineup. Mm. So is Harris mm. and B Lowry 
Maxi, and then Batum. Batum. Yeah, okay, those gotcha. five. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, your two thirty late thirties guys, uh, your two all stars, yeah. and Tobias Batum Harris. and Lowry, who are just willing to do anything to glue it all together. Don't need to score necessarily. Great with making the extra pass, drawing charges, or you know all mm -hmm. those things that don't necessarily show up in a box score. So. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm with Strong you. Strong light up on paper. I mean, but look, Kelly, Kelly Oubre Jr. has been so freaking good since March. I mean, he's he's averaging right around 20 points a game, putting up those numbers consistently, and his passing is improved by leaps and bounds. He's given consistent, strong defensive effort. He loves the big moments and, and has shined against some strong opposition this year. So yeah, I, I think it, it remains to be seen, right, whether, whether Tobias Harris like deserves, you know, 35, 40 minutes per game in the playoffs and whether the Sixers would be hurt if they're giving Harris those minutes and consequently not giving Kelly Oubre a ton of minutes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all that's still in the air. I think um, Harris, you know, needs needs to uh, be strong for the Sixers in, yeah. in second round playoff series should they get there. He's had a lot of good first round series for this team, but uh, round two has uh, not not been a highlight for him. And he's he's had a really up and down second half of this season. I think it's at least a plus that he's he's back out there healthy. Um, and as I said, had a solid game last night against the Detroit Pistons. But if we're talking about X factors, I think Kelly Oubre Jr.'s one where you have a lot of optimism about about the idea of him swinging a series. Then with Tobias Harris, I, he's another really important pivotal sort of player, and uh, I think still a lot unknown as far as. What is he going to bring to the table um, if and when the Sixers are are in round two? Playoffs are a different beast, though, man. They call it a second, the second season for a reason. Um, hopefully, I mean, Oubre showing up in the postseason would bring a lot of money his way, man, and uh, definitely endear him even more to the fans. And um, it seems like the Sixers are really positioned for some success. We're going to take a time out here and talk about uh, our title sponsors and those that support us along the way. I'm so proud of myself for saving some maxi talk for after this break. So um, we were, of course, brought to you by Wilmington University. Find your higher education home at Wilmington University, where your academic success is celebrated by a caring community. Explore your opportunities at wilmu.edu. Celebrity cook Steve Martirano brings his Italian-American cooking back home to Philly. Enjoy Martirano's Prime at Rivers Casino and Steve's famous meatballs with Sunday gravy, prime steaks, and more. Make reservations for Martirano's Prime on open table. Back here on the Sixers Talk podcast, um, a very memeable moment from last night's game was the cutaway to Tyrese Maxey after Joel Embiid hit that weird circus shot that he didn't get a foul call on with that look on Maxey's face. So funny. And, um, man, uh, nothing was funny about that 52 points that he dropped on the San Antonio Spurs. And, man, what an exciting game that was. And even more exciting that the Sixers got the win when they continued to have to fight to get back into the game. Um, I know you're a X's and O's guy, Noah, and that play that uh, Nick Nurse drew up when the Sixers needed a bucket to force OT and Tyrese Maxey lines up three quarters of the way from the basket and runs full speed and gets the pick off Kelly Oubre and the great entry pass from Nick Batum, um, who, uh, you know, is kind of goaded at this point as, as an inbounder. <laughs> but um, what a great game. It's so much fun. I'm sure Spurs fans hate seeing the Sixers on the schedule after MB gives them 70 and then Maxey goes for 52. But um, did you learn anything about the team watching that game? Uh, maybe something about their resiliency, uh, players who stepped up when you maybe didn't expect them to. And, um, you know, seeing Wemby uh, against the Sixers once again w was was really fat, um, hard to fathom some of the stuff that he was able to do, particularly that one left-handed dunk he had where <laughs> he's taking it to the basket. Next thing you know, he's ripping the rim down. But... Um, I pinpoint that game because of Maxie's 52, the way they came back, the double overtime, all of that. Um, a cr crazy game. Yeah, very, very memorable one. Yeah, I mean, the game-tying Maxie play, he looked sort of like an, an NFL kick returner, almost like weaving, nice. weaving yeah. through. And, um, yeah, his, his, I think, determination and persistence in that game shined to me. We know he's a, he's a tough-minded 
competitive person, mm -hmm. but I think part of this push for him to be more and more aggressive has just been when your bread, or, bread and butter isn't working, you, you need to trust that it eventually will. And he kept on going downhill in that second half and look like sometimes Wemby's going to change your shot and it's not going to go in and uh, you know you're not going to get friendly rolls every single time but uh, he just kept going over and over again and he has just such a, a diverse bag of tricks mm -hmm. um, I think you know you see the shiftiness with the changes of pace but then also those little subtle changes in, in angle and direction as a driver like he had he had one where he sort of looked like he was dribbling it laterally and then you know the spurs fell asleep a little bit boom close to the basket yeah well just flipped up a little floater yeah okay. and then he had yeah had, had certainly some where he just exploded exploded to the rim had an you know has those uh wrong foot finishes those wrong hand finishes Which he practices so. and yeah he <laughs> practices them all the time um and is learning more and more that okay, it's not going to be effective every single play, but especially when Joel Embiid is out, the right play for the team is to believe that this is eventually going to start working for me. So yeah, he was he was incredibly clutch. So was Ricky Council the fourth, zero minutes the first three quarters, and then he was downright brilliant in uh, the fourth and overtime. He wants to take those clutch free throws. He wants to drive hard to the rim. He's very good at drawing fouls. And he made one of the best passes of the year. That oh little God. lefty wraparound assist to Batum for a corner three. So uh, Council, I think, has already shown on a few occasions that he's a gamer and that he has skills that are already effective at the NBA level. But uh, this, no doubt, strengthened that impression that he's a guy with... Um, what it takes to stick in this in this league, and who has just extraordinary self belief as a rookie. Uh, yeah, Batum's Batum's inbound passing, both on the game tying play and then the one where Ubre uh, missed a potential game winner in the corner. Um, he basically gets the ball and then you know flings this whatever sixty foot cross court pass right on the money. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, was was not a game-winning basket for the Sixers. That was when they had point eight on the clock or whatever. Yeah, I think it was at the end of the first OT. Um, and, yeah, the Sixers were, were thankful to finish it off in the second OT. But, um, yeah, look, we, we knew Tyrese Maxey was, was a great player. I think this, this is a game that enhanced his most improved player case, which was already very, very strong. And uh, for me, Ricky Council IV um, is probably next in line as, as far as who deserves – tons and tons of credit for the Sixers winning winning a tough game um he well, had that reversal like he in. was incredible yeah, yeah. yeah. um and just like you, you don't want to read too much into you know intangible body language things but boy when he when he takes cut clutch free throws his expression is that of someone who wants the ball and who has been thinking about this moment and has zero doubt that he's going to make the shots like he's he's not a knockdown shooter but, you know, this is a few times now, the, um, a game in Cleveland being, being another, where he stepped up to that line and he looked like he knew he was going to make both of them, and he, he damn sure did. So uh, great stuff by the rookie. And then uh, the relative veteran, 23-year-old Tyrese Maxey, 52, in a uh, career-high 54 minutes. Not too bad. And just just does not look fatigued. Just yeah. does not. This looks like he can go another. Yeah, I mean it's funny. I had I had asked Nick Nurse uh, a few days prior uh, about Maxie's minutes. He'd played 44 in both the Clippers games, and and whether he was fine with that. And he essentially said, you know, we don't want to do that every night, but yeah, I think he's gotten to a place where this is right for him, and he needs to do this to get better. He he's basically at that tier of player now where the Sixers need him to be on the floor to pull out tough games. And and he didn't play great against the Grizzlies. Didn't yeah. play, yeah, I mean, yeah, he had a very sort of deferential night there. Um, but certainly, yeah, his... his Just mentioned in the back-to-back, -back, you know. Yeah, 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 you know, no, come, yeah, right. Know. I mean, that's that makes it more impressive. And yeah, yeah his, his peak level is such that he's one of those, he's a guy now where... You feel it's necessary to have on him on the court almost every second. We've long talked about Joel Embiid in those terms. 
Nick Nurse is, is seeing Tyrese Maxey that way, and I think that's a great example of why Nurse feels Maxey Maxi has ascended to that sort of level. Maxey, one of them ones, man, because uh, it just goes to show how he uh, just shows up when it matters most, and along with the play design by Nick Nurse, the way Maxi sold it, mm-hmm. you know, he's got his hands on his knees. Everyone knows he's probably going to be involved in the play somehow <laughs> because – you know, playing him as a decoy so far from the basket. Like, that's not how this play is going to end up. But It reminds me, though, like, and I think I'd route it up but as a critical point, the Clippers game they lost at home, there was the one where they just kind of left him in the backcourt mm-hmm. and Oubre got blocked by Kawhi. Yeah, that was not happening this time. You're going to give it to the guy who's uh, trending toward a career high. Yeah, uh, that brought us that famous Kelly Oubre moment where he called yes. out the referees um, and uh, got fined 100000 bucks for it. Mm-hmm. But... Um, yeah, man, just a uh, uh, crazy game to watch. One of those where you're so – if you have a chance to watch it with people, other Sixers fans, and you're all, like, jumping on each other or yelling or, you know, dealing with the emotional roller coaster, they're down and then they're back up, and there's one OT and a second OT. So just one of those great games. And um, the thing with Ricky Council, man, is, you know, from the, the summer league, man, he's shown – like, oh, you got to turn your head or he you know, draws your attention and, and brings, you know, something to the court that you take notice of. And uh, whether it's his savvy, whether it's him making plays when they matter, um, he just has a certain something about him. And uh, you, can, you can see the way he carries it. And uh, great, you know, scouting by the Sixers team to, to bring him on board and, to, you know, give him a contract. And on top of all that, and him being a gamer and, and showing up, you know, when it matters. Nick Nurse calling his number and his name in those moments. Uh, he deserves some credit, too, of, of pulling the right strings and getting the right people on the court. And uh, to have, you know, this rookie come in and who I'm sure isn't high on the Spurs scouting report. And then he shows up and, you know, does does these things that you don't expect uh, is a, a big breath of fresh air, man. Yeah, and, and now the question is, will he indeed deservedly be converted from, from a two-way contract? Uh, so the, the, the we'll see whether that happens. in the postseason, so all these guys can't be playing, right? Uh, not everyone can be yeah. playing, but um, look, I, I think it's, it's not ludicrous to imagine him being thrown into a spot like that unexpectedly and, and actually playing well for the Sixers. And yeah, I just think big picture, he, he sure looks like a guy that, you want to have on the team moving forward and someone who's capable of continued growth, right? Like if, if the shot continues progressing, that's a big deal for council. And I think already with, with more game reps, you're seeing his growing comfort level as a passer. I mean, okay. The, the two <laughs> assist, he's not, he's not going to make that every night, but he even, he even had a couple nice plays where he went hard downhill in transition. The Spurs understandably were worried about him as a driver. And then, then he dropped off, Nice little passes to open teammates. So, uh, yeah, he's he's not a young rookie. I think he's he's 22, 23, but um, I think he's he's certainly a determined guy with uh, potential room to room to improve, and already um, being really productive in high pressure moments for the Sixers. So, yeah, who knows whether that translates to him having a rookie council game in his very first NBA postseason, um, but. I think uh, it's not a controversial opinion to say that he's earned and you know being converted to a standard NBA deal, and we shall see whether that indeed happens before the end of the regular season. Back to Maxi real quick. Uh, three fifty point or more games this season, um, which you probably didn't have on your bingo card. Um, then you couple him with Joel Embiid and all that he's been able to do this season, uh, the seventy points, and I think he has two fifty point. Uh, games along with that and suddenly you're talking about like a Luca and Kyrie type duo like one of the best duos in the NBA like these two guys are just um, suddenly uh, you know maybe you know last year's success definitely playing into this season and you know Maxi having to grow so much more because Joel was out and kind of carrying the weight so much but this is one of the marquee duos in the league man yeah i I mean there's there's zero question about it um certainly from a scoring perspective but but underrated some you think a little bit like do you think around the league i think i mean look i i think the uh, 
pushback of what have they done in the playoffs is fair, and, and we'll see what they do in the playoffs. Right. Um, of course, last year the duo was uh, James Harden and Joel Embiid, and, and that was also very formidable offensively. Now um, Tyrese Maxey has more on his plate. He looks up for the challenge. He looks uh, capable of continuing to, you know, 25 and 6 it, you know, in, in the postseason. Um, but, yeah, I, th- I think um, it's it's been rapid progress for Tyrese Maxey, yet yet steady progress. But, yeah, he's, he's one of the most, if not the most improved player in the league. Joel Embiid is, is an MVP player who's gotten better this season. And um, this, this is a great duo. But uh, we'll, we'll see how all the pieces mesh. They're not the only two, two guys on this team. And, uh, yeah, a, a lot still to be seen. But... Um, there's, there's no doubt at, at the end of this season, we might be saying, gosh, how did, how did we overlook this, this pairing as, you know, so ridiculously hard to stop or whatever. Right. Um, so we'll see how the playoffs shake out. Yeah. A lot of great duos out there, you know, Luca, Jamal Murray, I mean, Luca, uh, uh, Nicola and Jamal Murray or Nicola and Aaron Gordon, uh, KD and Devin Booker. Uh, so, you know, Harden and Kawhi, like take your pick, but I mean, I would take these two over anybody or against anybody at the very least. Um, Coming another cool thing uh, before we go to mention that came out of that Spurs Sixers matchup is Kyrie. I'm Kyrie uh, Maxi telling the story about how he and Victor Wimby kind of met and Wimby wanting to play him one on one and (laughs) uh, Maxi, you know, talking about how he blocked his shot at first and then he had to strap up and they kind of, you know, then, you know, the footage pops back up from 2022. So uh, pretty cool. You know what I'm saying? Um, to, yeah. to hear that type of story and, and to see this kid who we enjoy so much being, you know, in the mix with this wonder Ken, uh, you know, Victor Wimbanyana. And it, it was just cool thinking about how that might have gone in Maxie's head and then seeing, you know, some video on them you know, going back and forth. So um, a pretty cool moment. Yeah. Well, of course, and Nico Batum has known Wemby way back when, you know, back when he was a teenager and has been sort of sort of a mentor to him. So he's long known about, like, this guy's going to be, this is going to be special. Right. Tyrese Maxey also, yeah, got, got a little bit of heads up there. Uh, again, I mean, the the impression is that there's never been anyone anyone like this guy. I mean, he... He was knocking down, test, man. knocking down Steph Curry esque threes in that fourth quarter. Had one where he just put it up there and turned around. Um, and yeah, he's he's look looks like a player who could lead the league in blocks like every season that he plays. It's, it's just absurd uh, what he is capable of doing. And yeah, already like very intelligent, has a strong feel for the game, very competitive. Um, and the Sixers, I think, uh, not a bad thing. That, uh, he's in he's in the Western Conference. <laughs> I mean that that's projecting very far ahead. The Spurs are you know a 21 team right now, despite having having such an amazing talent. But um, yeah, he's he's not their problem to worry about in the 2030 NBA Finals, unless uh, the Sixers are you know making it all the way. So uh, yeah, no, he's he's ridiculous. And yeah, cool, cool to uh, hear Tyrese Maxey you know tell a little about those origins. Fun game coming up Friday against the Orlando Magic. Fun and important, so the competitiveness will be high. Pull up to the Wells Fargo Center if you haven't been to a game this year or if you just want to be in the house for what should be an exciting game, uh, the return of Markel Fultz, which is always interesting to see how he's received. But um, uh, the Magic team, not one to take lightly, so uh, hopefully the Sixers uh, bring their hard hat and their lunch pail, strap up their work boots for that one. Um, be sure to check out Noah Levick's work on NBCSportsPhiladelphia.com. Follow him on all social media pa- platforms at Noah Levick. For Ben Barry, I'm Danny Pomels. This has been the Sixers Talk Podcast brought to you by Wilmington University. Wilm, you works. We'll see you next time.